Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, on behalf of Manish Hyde, OBGYN, and uh, our research efforts, today is a Badger Bites. So we do these a few times throughout the year, and the intention is to just highlight certain research topics that people can benefit on. It's kind of like TED Talks, and so we invite three different people, and we have 15 minutes for each person, and then time for people to ask questions. But you know, an opportunity to try to see what people are doing and collaborate and um, just kind of elevate research in general. So we have three great um, people uh, talking to us today. This is a little bit of a different spin. So our focus is on industry-sponsored research today. So our first speaker is Kelly uh, Bauman. She's a research, our research clinic manager in OBGYN. She joined uh, December, 2021. And her research career spans more than 20 years with most of those years spent at Stanford. She has an MS in clinical research management, and her experience includes phase two and three um, industry-sponsored trials, grants, and investigator-initiated trials. And she's worked in multiple therapeutic areas and started her research actually in women's health and bring, comes back to women's health, so that's exciting. Um, and she, she brings a lot to our department, and we're excited to have her speak today. Dr. Baglava um, uh, is obviously our director, uh, division director of REI, has brought so much to our uh, OBGYN group and has really ramped up industry-sponsored studies. And so we're going to hear about what they're up to. Um, and then Janelle Sebecki, um, who's in Gynonc, an assistant professor with us. Um, she's the newly appointed co-leader of the Gynonc Clinical Trials Program at UW and then serves as the co-leader of OBGYN Resident Research Program. Um, and she's going to talk to us what, about like how the industry-sponsored work is interfacing within Gynonc. So Without ado, here we go, and I hope you enjoy. Okay. All right, not with all my glasses. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Let's see. This comic I, uh, I've had since I pretty much started in, in research and kind of goes with me wherever I go. I just thought it was kind of funny. <clears throat> Uh, my presentation this morning is an overview of industry-sponsored clinical trials, uh, a topic that I, oops, sorry, topic I, I really enjoy and uh, talking about. So um, let me start by saying uh, I have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Oops, I got to advance the slides too. Put me to work. Um, so there are three parts to my presentation, the what, why, and the how. Uh, first, I'm going to inform you of the status of industry trials in the department. Uh, let me back up for just a second. I work in non-oncology trials, so this is everything non-oncology. Um, second, I will explain why we need to partner with industry. And third, I'll explain how to get started uh, with an industry trial uh, in our department. So I started in the department, I started at UW and in this department in December 2021, the message was clear. Um, we want to grow the research department, uh, the research program in this department. And to grow research in a department, you really need industry trials. And what I saw is a department that was very grant heavy um, with very little experience with industry trials. So in December 21, when I started, we didn't have any open uh, clinical trials and the and by history just a couple of um, of trials um, I think there was a device trial maybe uh, seven eight years ago and then um, a, a drug trial that we were um, trying to close out Dr. Bhagavat had a, a protocol that was in budget negotiations and another trial he was kind of interested in but hadn't seen the the protocol yet jump forward to today uh, we currently have four uh, uh, industry trials enrolling. Three of those are in REI and one in ASOG. There's one starting soon in MFM. And then we have four uh, that we're just getting started as far as the um, site initiation process or the uh, site selection process and contracts. Um, two of those are in FPMRS and two are in MRI. REI. Did I say MRI? REI. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't want to, I have to advance this. Okay, here we are. Um, I, want, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the, the current trials, but just to give you an idea of what we have going on, uh, Dr. Kara Hoppe is the PI for the Morani trial. 
Marani has developed an app uh, to remotely connect providers directly to their pregnant patients, and specifically these patients with uh, uh, diagnosed with hypertension. Um, as you see up on the slide, this protocol will assess efficiency, usability, satisfaction, and effectiveness, not only on the clinician's part, but also the, the patient experience as well. Um, Dr. Ashley Jennings is the PI for the Teal Health trial. Um, Teal Health has developed a self-collection device for cervical cancer screening. Patients come in for one visit, they self-collect with this device. They complete a couple surveys. How easy was it used to, uh, to use the device? How easy was it read, uh, to read the instructions in completing that uh, collection? Then the patient moves on, has a clinic cl uh, clinician collected PAP, and then those samples are sent and compared. Does this device uh, collect the same cells comparable to the clinician collected PAP? Um, are those HPV cells, because we are enrolling HPV positive patients, are those HPV cells uh, in, uh, comparable to the clinician collected PAP? So why industry, why include industry trials? There's several reasons why we need to include industry trials in our research program. We really need to be on the cutting edge. Um, we, we need to be on the front line of clinical progress and just see what industry is working on uh, to advance medicine for our patients. We need, really need to be involved in what's coming next. Um, as far as junior faculty, the experience as a sub-I uh, will only help to make IITs better. When junior faculty have the experience of working on an, a federally funded um, an FDA regulated trial, um, they get to understand the, um, the importance of oversight, the importance of detailed uh, and complete documentation, importance of adverse event assessment, and, um, and also experience with regulations and what's required in these uh, FDA regulated protocols. We really need to provide patients the opportunity to, provide, to uh, participate in uh, industry trials. For patients, often it's, it's access to the latest in interventions and technologies. Sometimes you, you have the experience where there is no other treatment option except for a clinical trial. Um, I also believe that people are, um, for the most part, altruistic, that they really do want to contribute. Um, I spent nearly the first 10 years of my career in women's health and over and over again, women telling me, you know, I know, I understand this won't uh, probably help me, but if it helps my, my daughter or my granddaughter, I'm willing to do it. And what I used to tell people uh, when they participate in trials, if you ever watch TV, uh, you've seen medication commercials, right? By law, they have to state um, at the end of that commercial, they're usually rattling off all the um, possible side effects, right? What I tell people when they participate is that you're actually helping to provide, to, to contribute to that profile. So this is why we're asking you how you're doing, any changes in your health, um, keep that medication diary, keep, let us know how you're doing. Um, the other part of industry trials is the revenue. Uh, we can make money on these trials. Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. I feel like I'm losing my voice. Um, but we can make money on these trials and the thought, what we need to keep in mind is that industry budgets are very different than grant budgets. When you budget for an industry trial, and we are covering our costs, right? Everything that we're doing for the research protocol, those costs are covered. The PI oversight, the time taken to oversee that protocol, the coordinator effort, um, we need to make sure we are covering because coordinators um, play such an integral role in the administration of clinical trials. And when you think about it, when the trial is done, IRB is being closed out, your account is being closed out, you're either in the red or you're in the black. We do not have to be in the red, we can definitely make money on these trials. <clears throat> so um, how to get started. First and foremost, when you um, want to participate in an industry sponsored trial, the first thing that has to be done is a non-disclosure agreement. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. I'm all... Okay. Um, it always starts with a non-disclosure agreement. Also called a CDA, um, a confidential disclosure agreement. And when you are, uh, when a sponsor contacts you, um, to uh, maybe discuss this trial if you're interested in it, 
they'll send an email and they'll send the non-disclosure in an email and they'll say, sign here and send back to us. What you have to know at University of Wisconsin, physicians are not able to sign those non-disclosures. And I put up on the, um, on the right side there, and this is a signature page of a non-disclosure. There's no indication that it needs to go to contracts. And when they send an email that says, please sign and send back, you have no indication. You, you don't know that you're not able to sign those agreements and send them back. They need to be routed through contracts. So what I ask is that whenever you are contacted by a sponsor, they send the non-disclosure, just forward it to me. Um, Toria, our, our clinical trials billing specialist, will submit that to contracts and get that process started. From there, um, there's going to be a communication between the sponsor and the physician. Are you interested in this trial? Are they interested in you? <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're going to require a site evaluation survey. They want to know, <clears throat> what is your experience in working with this patient population? How many patients are, are you seeing in the, you know, say for a month or the last year? Um, your coordinators, are they experienced in, in, uh, in uh, coordinating trials? Um, do you have SOPs for informed consent process? Um, what does it take to, um, to get a trial started? Because startup is always uh, pricey. And so, um, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. And so, Part of this evaluation, the sponsor needs to know that you have the patient population that they are looking for. The thing to keep in mind is that, um, is that time is money for both of us. Time is money on the industry side because they know exactly how many subjects they need to enroll before they can close enrollment. These protocols are expensive for them, so they want to keep things going. If you, um, uh, it, it's expensive, uh, time is, <clears throat> Sorry, time is money on our end because enrollment is competitive. So these are multi-center studies. And so um, when you get started in this trial, uh, sorry, when you get started in the trial, you have to be efficient. You have to have the patients, you have to have a plan for how you're going to enroll these patients. And Trust me, the sponsor will say, as soon as they reach their enrollment goal, they're gonna end enrollment. They won't go any further, there's no need to, and it just costs them money. So what, um, when you start conversations with, uh, with sponsors about these trials, what they wanna know is, what does it take to get a study up and running? What is your contract process? What is the budget process? And what is the IRB? Those three things have to happen before you can get started, right? I like to process in parallel. And when I've spoken to um, other managers in other departments, that's not typically what, um, or they hadn't been doing this by history, um, they would wait for the budget to be negotiated. And because if you start the, um, if you process in parallel and you, you're doing the um, IRB at the same time you're doing the budget, and the budget falls flat and they don't wanna do business with you, you can't come to an agreement on the budget, they're gonna walk away. And then you're, you're stuck with IRB fees. The way I approach these is that processing in parallel, one is more efficient, which the sponsor wants to hear. You're gonna cut down your processing time for startup. But when sponsors contact us, one, they like academic centers. We are research oriented. We have a big patient population and Sorry. <laughs> and once they get to that point to include us, they want to do business with us. So it's kind of a risk, but it's kind of not because I can negotiate a budget that can reach a happy medium and we can be all right and still make money on this trial. And that's what... Um, the efficiency is, is really where it's at with these trials. I feel like I just ran through this whole presentation, but um, does that bring up any questions at all? Here's my contact information. If you have any questions about um, industry trials, please feel free to, to reach out. Happy to talk further about it. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation. Thanks, Kelly, for that great introduction. So 
uh, I realize that perhaps a small um, uh, introduction as to how I got here is in order. I started clinical trials as a fellow. Uh, Dr. Carr, my uh, fellowship director and division director, was big into trials, uh, menopause medicine specifically. So we were doing a lot of uh, industry-sponsored uh, trials on menopause. We had our own uh, BMD um, uh, evaluating the service and like in-house just for our research. So it was in that order. Uh, so that was my first uh, introduction to clinical trials. Subsequently, when I became a junior faculty at Brown, I had the opportunity to work on a industry-sponsored trial for fertility uh, care. In fact, it's coming full circle and I'm my, I, we are in the process of negotiating using the same drug for another trial now, which is interesting. Um, and also I uh, put in a investigational new drug uh, protocol uh, for uh, fertility-based uh, medication as well, growth hormone, use of specifically growth hormone uh, in uh, decrease awareness of patients. So those were introductions. I learned my ropes there. And then when I moved to Rochester and I uh, developed the Freiburg Center, uh, it was a perfect um, uh, amalgamation of my skills uh, that I had already gathered to go into device trials because Freiburg Center brought attention um, to or brought us up in the eyes of um, the various uh, uh, surgical equipment manufacturers because they are interested in get, getting their hands on these fibroid patients. And so we got involved in many of those uh, industry-sponsored device trials. Plus, of course, we continued with medications as well. So when I came here and I realized that there's nothing going on, but my contacts from industry were all calling me, asking for, you know, if I'm still interested in doing one trial or the other, uh, it was a perfect opportunity to uh, develop that here at Generations. So with that, uh, introduction. I'm happy to talk to anybody who is interested uh, in how, uh, how how I developed the whole thing. It's contacts, contacts, and contacts, and all the um, conferences you attend uh, are very, very important for that, uh, really, uh, to uh, get you ahead. So we have these following um, uh, clinical trials in my division. You've noticed that I have included some Retrospective studies, they are clinical trials as well, in a sense. Uh, these are mainly for resident research projects, um, but there is one um, non-industry sponsored, the one that's highlighted in purple, uh, that we are doing with University of Iowa, uh, which is a multi-center uh, trial on PCOS patients and IUI, just amazing um, recruitment going on with that. Uh, but we have three, um, uh, three studies that are industry sponsored um, that are entirely um, uh, uh, under the auspices of industry and no other funding source. The first one is local, uh, it's prospective multi center localized directional insemination trial for artificial insemination, quite a mouthful. Uh, the company that sponsors, and the reason I'm bringing all this up is um, the next time you are. Um, in a conference and you look at industries, you know, you look at their portfolio, you see what um, opportunities you have to help them and for them to help you answer some questions uh, that are clinically relevant for your population. So here, Pharmacist is the company. They are not new to the scene. As you can see, they have multiple products. They have three products that are already commercially available. You probably are familiar with them, uh, FemU, FemCath, as well as the FemServe. Um, but in addition to that, they have a couple of uh, products that they are uh, currently trialing. Uh, FemBlock is for permanent birth control. Um, so uh, again, you may be familiar with the Isure, the problems that Isure produced. And um, so here they are trying to innovate and not have the problems uh, of litigation that Isure had, but still uh, have a comparable con a contraceptive. Um, but in addition to that, they have the Femaseed, which is the product that we are currently evaluating. So let me play this.
So the premise here is, um, it was a shock to me when I came to um, Madison and realized that so many patients can't afford. I had always worked in states where uh, insurance covered uh, up to IVF and to come here and not even IUI is covered. In fact, in some cases, even diagnostics is not covered uh, was uh, quite a system shock. Uh, and my whole way of practice had to change and my thinking had to change. Uh, so this one, the advantage, or at least what they're trying to see is, can a very low sperm count be still adequate uh, to result in a pregnancy without resorting to IVF? For example, less than 10 million uh, total model count in an IUI specimen uh, typically doesn't have a high chance of pregnancy. Less than five, almost unheard of. Very rare to achieve a pregnancy when you have less than 5 million total model count. So here, the recruitment strategy is between one and 20 million. Obviously, they want to cross over and show if there is uh, any advantage even up to 20 million. The idea is that if you knew which side the um, uh, ovulation is occurring, you can directionally inseminate into the fallopian tube and thereby uh, improve the chance of pregnancy. It has ineligibilities. And one of the things about um, all these trials is Number one, do you have the patient population in your clinic setting to uh, recruit into this? But number two is the eligibility and ineligibility criteria. Some trials have such long ineligibility criteria that ultimately, even though you have the patient population, they'll just get whittled down and you don't have them uh, fitting the criteria to be enrolled into the study. So in this particular case, thankfully, you know, very few ineligible criteria, and as a result, our recruitment is doing very well. As opposed to the next study, which is a big uh, industry-sponsored trial, phase three single-arm study of contraceptive efficacy of religolics combined with estradiol and norethindrone when used for endometriosis and fibroids. So the company here is Myovan, and it has a portfolio as well um, that is very much in our space. And what they do is once they are ready, they partner with big companies, uh, in this case, Pfizer, to actually um, uh, uh, sell the product. So Religolix uh, at the moment uh, has been approved in three separate scenarios. As you can see uh, with oncology, um, they have uh, in, in men, uh, they have the product available commercially. And for women in uh, recent times, they have MyFembry, that has been approved uh, for use both for fibroids um, and uh, for bleeding and endometriosis for pain control. But what they are trying to do here is to say, prove that if they are on my femory, they do not need additional contraception. Because right now, unfortunately, that has not been proven. So by, if you look at the FDA, you have to have additional protection. So uh, it makes sense. This is uh, inducing menopause artificially. So the uh, it makes common sense that there should be no need for uh, additional contraception. But then for FDA, everything has to be proven. So this is now a study going on. Unfortunately for this, the ineligibility criteria is um, a history of infertility. And as you can imagine, fibroids and uh, endometriosis, infertility is going hand in hand. So it's a huge ding. And even though you have enough patients, unfortunately, when you apply the eligibility and ineligibility criteria, many of these patients get, um, uh, get thrown out and cannot be enrolled in the study. So we are struggling quite a bit. We are throwing our net, net wide. And here's where strategies, you know, in the past, one of the things that works really well is radio advertisement in terms of recruiting patients for the trials. And you can negotiate with the company to have advertisement dollars for that. Unfortunately, we can also get a lot of hits of patients who are really not eligible, but they are just hits because they hear uh, the advertisement and they come for it. It's also short term, you know, you keep running the uh, ad, it doesn't work. It's like a, you have to hit it for a short period of time. Best is, of course, directly contacting your referring doctors and speaking to them and um, uh, keeping this trial on their mind. The biggest problem with that is studies are not really on the uh, uh, in the mind of doctors walking in to see a patient. Even I, in my clinic, sometimes will miss a patient and say, 
as soon as the patient left, said, gosh, I forgot to tell her about the study. So um, when that happens to me as a PI, I can imagine with all the other doctors who are just hearing about the study, but they don't have um, that all the all these prominent on their uh, in their thought as they walk into their patient. So repeated uh, uh, emails or flyers do help in that regard. And one other thing that we do here, since we have the advantage of looking into other um, uh, other clinic uh, patients and their schedules, is identify the potential patients and directly contact the provider like a week ahead and say, you're going to see this patient on Tuesday. Can you please uh, remember to tell this patient about the study? So th those are all many, many strategies that you have to employ uh, to um, make sure that your enrollment is on track. Um, and finally, this, some of the heading is cut off. Um, uh, the Juvena is a gel. Um, we have many patients with Asherman syndrome, all of us have them. And one of the frustrating things uh, to take care of because they uh, recur uh, repeatedly despite operating on them multiple times. Uh, and one of the things we do is give hormones, estrogen at high doses in the hope that it'll quickly uh, cover up the raw area or uh, and or use a Foley balloon or another uterine stent that's no longer in the market uh, to try and keep the uh, two surfaces separate uh, and give time to uh, heal before the uh, surfaces come in contact again. Unfortunately, there are no studies proving the efficacy of either the estrogen uh, treatment or uh, placing an intrauterine balloon. The, um, this gel uh, is fantastic in that it will, first of all, uh, I'll show you a video as to the difference between using the balloon and the gel. Um, but in addition to that, it dissolves. It's a non-toxic gel. It's used in other, um, uh, other settings, uh, especially in neurosurgery. They use it a lot. So it's uh, proven to be non-toxic. And what we do is inject it into the uterus. It immediately gels up and then it uh, autolyzes over a period of three weeks and just turns into water and comes out. So um, it's really the ideal, uh, ideal product to try and help these patients um, uh, have lasting benefit from the surgery and not have multiple recurrences. So the company is rejoining and they don't have a portfolio. So the reason I'm bringing up is this is a one-off company. This is their only product that they have. Um, and the idea is as depicted here, injecting the gel into the uterus and within literally even uh, you have to get uh, trained on the speed of injection because if you are a little too slow, it actually clots within the catheter itself. So you have to actually have a steady speed as you inject it. So it's, uh, uh, it's very effective very, very quickly. So let me play this video, which shows you the difference or at least theoretically. So the gel goes in and sets and that's how it looks. Sometimes patients say that it, it, they can see that coming off in chunks and the difference between how it covers the corneal surfaces uh, versus this um, Foley balloon that we insert currently uh, and how it very unevenly uh, separates the uterine cavity and doesn't really in any way um, uh, take care of the corneal surfaces. So that's, you know, you can see the difference. It doesn't really help at all. And a lot of times patients are in extreme discomfort as well uh, because of the uh, pressure from the Foley balloon and they can't keep it in uh, for one week that we usually ask them to keep it in for. Um, the idea behind this is for fibroids, primary prevention. So if you do a resection of uh, a hysteroscopic section of the uterine fibroids, uh, you want to insult the gel to prevent adhesions from forming. And for Ashman syndrome, it's a secondary prevention because they already have the Ashman syndrome. Now you are uh, taking care of it, but you want to prevent a, a recurrence of that. So it's two pronged. So the recruitment for these patients, for this study, is either fibroid patients or Ashman patients with Ashman syndrome. The Difficulty with this study is the two is to one randomization. So for every two patients who gets the gel, one patient will not get the gel 
and they won't be told. It's a blinded study. So patients balk at the fact that they may undergo the surgery, but not have the benefit of your usual treatment because they're not allowed to have the balloon or the estrogen or they gel. They would not know. The one good thing is they get a free second leukostroscopy six to 10 weeks later. So when they come back, they can have not only the rep repetition of the diesolysis or uh, in, in the resection, it's not a problem, but uh, if they have ad additions from the uh, uh, fibroid resection, then you can take care of that as well at the same time. And then you can use hormones or the uh, fully balloon as you normally do. So there's a delay and they have a second surgery. But the advantage with that is most, if I had my way, I would do a second look laparoscopy and 100% of patients I do Asherman's uh, adesolysis on. Unfortunately, many insurances won't cover that. And studies have shown that repeated adesolysis is the best treatment uh, at the moment in the absence of a product like this. We have other studies in the pipeline. There's the long-acting FSH that I said I, uh, when I was a junior faculty at Brown, I was involved in. It's coming back. Then there's transvaginal ovarian drilling for PCOS that Dr. Cooney is trying to get on board. And finally, needle-free delivery system for fertility drugs, which as you can imagine, our patients take three injections a day sometimes. And to have a needle-free uh, delivery system would be just an amazing thing. So those are all in the works. Um, just with that, I just, I didn't know what this whole thing was. So if anybody wants to talk to me personally about how to start an industry trial, how to talk to the industry, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Last but not least, we are going to talk about our um, Gynonc clinical trial uh, portfolio and kind of our organizational process. Thanks to Manish and Kara for inviting me to give you an overview. See if this works. Perfect. Um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, the one thing I will say is that for the scope of this talk, this is going to be a really broad bird's eye overview of our clinical trials program. Um, but I'm certainly happy to take any, you know, questions about any of the details or specific studies if anyone is interested. Um, so really important um, with Gynot Clinical Trials is organization. So we're going to start with um, an overview of our national organization for our clinical trials and also our institutional organization for clinical trials. Um, so really important um, to Gynonc clinical trial work um, is the GOG Foundation, um, which is the overseen organization that oversees clinical trial efforts in Gynonc nationally. Um, and under this big umbrella of the GOG Foundation are kind of two big bodies bodies of clinical trial work. Um, so the first is our federally funded uh, trials, which include NRG, our NCTN trials, and then industry. And since today was a little bit more about talking about industry, what we have within the GOG Foundation is the GOG partners. And that is the kind of sub umbrella of the GOG Foundation that helps manage any non federally funded clinical trials. So this can be funding coming from um, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, um, philanthropic um, funding, and the GOG partners portion of GOG Foundation serves as site management for those non-federally funded um, efforts as well. Um, and then not really in the scope of this talk, but the GOG Foundation overall, you can see also covers a tremendous amount of support, mentoring, outreach, um, our other national organizations, um, and really serves as kind of the central body that helps connect institutions and patients with clinical trials on both the federally funded side and the non-federally uh, funded side. Then at an institutional level, um, the Carbon Cancer Center has a very specific clinical trial organization. Um, and so the way that Carbone organizes clinical trial efforts in oncology is by dividing the different disease sites um, or disease-oriented teams, you'll hear us use the word DOT, um, into different pods. And this is the management structure because of all of the personnel and organization that's required to run these trials at our institution. Um, and so you can see these different DOTs, these specific um, disease-oriented teams are organized in a pod structure. We happen to be pod one. I like to think that's because we're number one, but <laughs> um, so we live in pod one um, along with some other disease sites and another dot. 
Um, within these disease-oriented teams, so this is at the DOT level, there are a lot of really important personnel and overseeing bodies that exist to help support each DOT um, and our clinical trial efforts. Um, and so you can see in this kind of complicated schematic. Um, we have several overseeing committees and bodies that helps with data, safety, making sure protocols are being followed appropriately. Um, and then within that dot, we also have a billing team, finance team, regulatory team, we've got our navigators, we've got operations, we've got QA compliance. So this is the organized structure that really helps us run studies well, um, and takes a lot of effort and a lot of organization to do that at the institutional level. Um, in our GYNONC dot specifically, we have a wonderful, robust um, team of very talented individuals. Um, we have faculty co-leaders, which are has been Dr. Hartenbach for quite some time, um, and I have newly jumped on board. Our role is really to oversee the scientific direction of our clinical trials program, so helping with what studies we think we're going to accrue well to, science that we're excited about, and really helping kind of choose the direction and the portfolio that we hope to have. Um, each pod um, has a program manager. Um, that is Claire. She oversees our DOT um, and operations within our DOT, um, helps to make sure that we are, you know, choosing studies that are feasible and appropriate within our site. Um, we also have a protocol administrative coordinator, who is Hannah, and she really manages protocol specific things. So there's a lot that goes into these protocols um, in terms of activation, maintenance of protocol, lots of regulatory paperwork, um, and she serves in that role. We also have a clinical team manager, Nicole, and she oversees our day-to-day -day operations in our DOT. Um, so oversees our research coordinators, oversees um, a lot of regulatory things on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got an awesome team of clinical research coordinators um, and RNs. These are the people in clinic doing recruitment, adverse event reviews, speaking to the patients on a really normal basis or common basis, routine basis, um, and really the, the people that have a lot of patient facing time with our patients on clinical trials. And then we also have um, Haley, who is our data coordinator. So big effort, lots of talented people um, who help make our clinical trials program a success. Um, within our group of trials. Um, there's a couple different areas that trials exist in. So certainly our treatment-based trials. Um, we also have prevention, supportive care, screening, and then these trials are coming from a handful of different places. So we talked about, you know, industry trials, through GOG Foundation on the non-federally funded side. We certainly have um, federally funded trials coming through NRG Oncology. There are some institutional trials, so there'll be institutions across the country that design multi-site um, efforts that we are often a part of, um, as well as our inv investigator-initiated trials and biospecimen. We're not gonna talk a lot about biospecimen today, but that's an important component of kind of our entire portfolio. Um, this gives you an idea of how many protocols are kind of open and closed within a year. So you can see, you know, somewhere around 15, dozen or 15 or so. Um, and these are trials that, you know, things open and close. So some trials we, you know, start accruing to, they close because they've met their, you know, participation endpoint or, you know, one of their scientific endpoints. Um, and so there's a lot of flux that happens. We'll have stuff open, things will close, we'll be working on opening new things. Um, but you can see that's about kind of the average number of protocols we have open at any one given time time. Um, some of the industry studies that we have going on right now um, include, you know, these pictures here, a little out of the scope today to kind of dig into each of these specifically. Um, but what you can see here is we've got a couple trials that are looking at maintenance therapy for patients, um, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer. We also have um, some surgical trials open. And I think what's really important about our portfolio is that we try to have a broad scope of clinical trials available. So that includes trials for all of our different um, gynonc cancer disease sites, as well as different phases of patients' treatment. So that includes upfront trials, maintenance trials, trials in the recurrent setting. You know, for ovary, we try to always have a platinum resistance study open. So we try to keep this portfolio broad so that we can really maximize the impact that we have um, to our patient population. Um, we also have a handful of NRG trials. So these are our federally funded trials. Um, SOROC is a trial um, 
looking at surgical management of patients with BRCA um, in the risk reduction category. Um, we also have an upfront um, uh, 019, there is an upfront trial for our patients with low-grade ovarian cancer. Um, and then we also have another um, looking at um, the addition of trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and um, FESCO um, in our endometrial cancer patients. So again, broad scope, some surgical, some treatment, and a couple of different disease sites. Um, I also want to mention that our DOT um, does try to really have a robust support of our um, investigator-initiated trials. So our division has kind of a really long-standing record of really supporting um, our PIs with these, these IITs. Um, and this is just a handful that um, are kind of more recently open, um, and that includes um, the Lance trial, which is actually one of those multi-institution trials being run out of MD Anderson, um, as well as um, Dr. Barlett's epidural study, which I'm sure some of our residents um, are very familiar with helping with. Um, I'm doing an IIT on bone loss and gynoc patients. Um, Dr. Barlett also is participating in a um, kind of imaging and uh, PSMA marker study um, for detection. We also always have lots of things coming down the pipeline. So these are just a sampling of things that are currently in activation. Um, Dr. Wallace and Matt Wagar are working on another IIT looking at um, method of anesthesia block um, for patients undergoing surgery. Um, we also are excited about um, adding an NCI combo match trial to our portfolio. So that is a biomarker specific um, study that's gonna be open to our patients with RAS pathway mutations um, in our cancers. And then um, Dr. Berlet is participating in a data collection study nationally looking at uh, use of PARP inhibitors. And that's all I've got for our, our brief overview. Happy to take questions. <clears throat> Just want to say thanks to all of our speakers. We're doing a lot of really great things. Kelly's leading this effort in our clinical research office. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions? And yeah. For anybody that may not, but you know, I just was going to say, if anyone can't hear, that's listening. Dr. Hartenbach just wants to know what people need in the realm of research support to help bring forth the efforts in clinical trials. Right? Yeah. I was just going to check the chat. There's a shout out to you, Kelly, who's been amazing at helping somebody navigate this process for the first time. Uh, I, I guess a question for people doing it. So there's a lot of like learners, residents, other people, like when you work with industry sponsored, is there ability to publish or do secondary analyses on these trials? I mean, just as ideas for like, can people interface other than like the direct benefit of like, advancing science, you know, with industry? I have. Um, the short answer is depends. Uh, yes, I have uh, had my name published on papers, very seminal papers, um, as first author, actually. So it's entirely possible, but not always. For example, that phase three trial, by my event, that's going to have so many, so many different um, institutions. It's unlikely that your name will be on it. But the, uh, I think the um, uh, satisfying part of it is that you've involved in something cutting edge and 
you learn so much from it, you do learn so much from it. So that is always there. So even if your name doesn't get on study, uh, the fact that you're involved in the study and you understand the product and what the uh, pros and cons are, it by itself is really helpful. Yeah. To summarize, it opens doors. I totally agree. Heidi. Um, I have been involved in a couple different types of these trials. So there's sometimes an opportunity where you get a little cash every time you enroll a patient in a trial, and that can benefit, that can support the unfunded work that you're doing in your division. But other times you're not doing, it's not a situation where you're enrolling um, a bunch of patients and testing a trial, but rather an industry partner wants to test something and they're willing to donate some stuff and you're not getting that same cash, but then you're getting more of a chance for the authorship participation and building so that next time you can, you've got preliminary data and a um, relationship established with industry. So there's lots of different ways in which it can be a win and it can be sort of a gateway into discovering what you like about research and how you want to continue to, you know, sort of continue to give back to our patients. Yeah, I want to say one more example, um, a resident research project that um, I did early in my career um, was a a desire of a resident to say, hey, does this wound infiltration device, this anesthetic device, does it work? They're putting it over at St. Mary's. And I said, I don't really know. What's the literature? Well, the resident actually designed it. The company supplied the pump and uh, and we handled that as an IET. Um, and, um, and so that's, you know, industry donating the, the 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 pump was was enough to help us do that on our own and i think kelly said something about you know making revenue off of these trials we don't we don't do all this work to 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 make a lot of money that's not the point but they they um they they do often pay for themselves and sometimes there are additional funds so that then we can turn over and develop um and as um heidi said uh, take care of some of our other unfunded research areas. So, I mean, we're a nonprofit. We're not. We're not. We're not out to make you know uh, uh, a lot of money. Uh, and so, I just no, exactly. No, we're, that that's not the point at all. But but our um, managed appropriately, our industry sponsors, you know, have the same goals that we do, which is to improve health. And so, um, so working with them and developing new uh, protocols and projects for people can do that. And the funding um, can can you know they're they they're 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 not a cost to us. There are occasions where, in fact, um, quite frequently we have residual funds that then we can reinvest in other parts of our research program. So, um, thank you so much. Um, Manish wants to shout out to Dr. Kushner. Uh, thank you for your foresight and efforts in developing our human subject office. And Dr. Kushner wants to say something too. So I want to give him a chance. And I want, but while you're getting there, um, in MFM, actually, they're studying a trial on uh, use of glucose sensors, and the company gave all the glucose sensors and phones. So, like, again, if you have an idea of something, industry will give you the tools sometimes to do the work you need to do for free. Yeah, so it's nine o'clock, so I won't bring up a new topic, but I will just um, one last comment about what we've been discussing. As a, um, a young investigator, someone new starting into this, um, as you're starting to work with industry, that's the time to negotiate and discuss what the benefits are going to be to the institution and to yourself. Um, there can be more than you think. You have to understand, you know, is there authorship? Well, maybe there could be, but you need to discuss it up front. Um, what would be the terms of authorship if we get that? That can all be figured out at the beginning. Can I get data? Can we, um, is there ability to get data? Some of these things are available, but they're only available if you ask for them. So um, helping us help you negotiate that at the beginning is really important.
We have like one minute till nine. So if anyone has anything, speak up now. Otherwise, all these people are available. Um, and I think we're moving in the right direction and we'll just keep trying to grow. If anyone's ideas for future Badger Bites, let us know. Oh, yes. Keep sending patients for the promo trial and support Jackie's work. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That will make change in the care we provide. So please, please, if you're going to think about uh, oral miso, use the promo trial. <laughs>